Okay, Mark, I think that's fine. Hello, and welcome everybody. For those of you who live in the UK, you might know that for quite a while now, we've been experiencing what meteorologists call an anti-cyclonic gloom. And for the first day in a long time, I can actually see the sun, which is a welcome relief. And today it gives me great pleasure to welcome also a bit of sunshine, uh, when it comes to a speaker, uh, a friend of Benedict's well, an inspiration, uh, Father Dermot Mercu, who often has a great deal of interesting and powerful things to say to us as a community. So Dermot, you are very welcome and we look forward uh, to hearing you speak a little later. But first to our time of meditation, so we now begin to settle ourselves um, in our seats, inviting our bodies to become that which we want for our minds, open, welcoming and still. O oh God, come to our assistance. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And Dermot chose two readings to go with his title, Incarnation, its meaning for the 21st century. And I'm just going to read one of them. And this is from Sister Elizabeth Johnson, who is an American uh, theologian. Incarnation bespeaks a different form of divine presence marked by an unimaginable intensity of intimacy. It is presence in the flesh. The saving God became a human being who was part of the wider human community, which shares the membrane of life with other creatures, all made from cosmic material. Our opening prayer, Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the silent presence of the spirit of your son. Lead us into that mysterious silence where your love is revealed to all who call. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus.
So, as I said earlier, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dermot Mercu to speak to us today. He is a priest and a social psychologist, and he's going to reflect with us on the theme of the incarnation, its meaning for the 21st century. Um, he's actually got two books on um, this topic, Incarnation, A New Evolutionary Threshold, and when the disciple comes of age. So Dermot, it's really good to welcome you back and we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks again for inviting me. Um, greetings everybody, whichever time zone you happen to find yourself in. Now, just um, a very brief introduction and then I will turn over to some slides which I will share with you. I come from the Catholic tradition, and back in 1970, the research showed that about 5% of all theologians of the Catholic Church were lay people, which means that 95% were priests. And that was in keeping, of course, with the guidelines from the Council of Trent in the 16th century. Uh, which restricted the study and exploration of theology uh, to priests only and seminarians, people training to become priests. Then the horizon began to open up and to widen out. And today we reckon that in the Catholic faith community around the world, about 65 to 70 percent of all theologians are lay people, and therefore the priest theologian is um, a declining species, so to speak. Now, this has huge implications for our understanding of theology. Um, formerly, most people associate theology with religion, and that is very much the approach coming from the more clerical side. But for the emerging lay people, theology is very much about the world and about the whole of God's creation. Um, and it's coming from that particular background that I offer you the reflections that I'm sharing with you today. The reason I chose this topic is we're coming up to the season of Advent, leading into Christmas time. Um, and this is very much a theological concept, helping us to understand the meaning of both Advent and Christmas. So bear with me while I bring up uh, some of my images, and then we will be um, moving. Right, so first, just to clear the air a little bit then on this concept of incarnation, uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, um, is, has been traditionally um, and still is um, a, a leading understanding of the role of Jesus in our Christian faith, and particularly what we're celebrating at Advent and Christmas time. In that conventional understanding, incarnation is understood to be a once-off event, a divine intervention that happened once and once only about 2,000 years ago. Secondly, that this incarnation of God among us is only possible in and through the Jesus of Christianity. And consequently, it's only in and through the um, intervention of God in the person of Jesus that all humankind can be saved. No other religion can offer salvation, according to this conventional understanding. And then finally, salvation in this uh, understanding is for human beings only. It has nothing to do with the other creatures that share creation with us and nothing to do with the earth itself. That is still the formal understanding theologically. And if you are to ask me, well, what's the formal teaching of the church? Um, of all the Christian churches, it would be this. And yet, even um, among clerical theologians, um, a lot of them would, would try to expand that meaning. I would say that that's a very narrow meaning, uh, but it is still the formal uh, meaning. And some of the evangelical Christians around the world would be holding on to that 
quite tightly. The major shift then is in this one. Um, among uh, theologians at large, particularly those coming from the ground up, but indeed, to be fair, a number of priest theologians as well, that theology needs to be understood as a being about embodiment. That our God works with bodies, and it's in and through bodies that God reveals God's self primarily. Now, the primary body that our God works with is the universe or the cosmos. And so our God has been incarnating or revealing God's self in and through that creation for billions of years before we ever came along, before churches or religions were ever invented, and so forth. So the universe is the primary body through which our God incarnates and reveals God's self or God's creativity in our world. Then secondly, planet Earth is also a body um, and has huge implications then for how we understand our human bodies because we are earthlings as creatures. And then mountains, lakes, trees, plants all have bodies. And so they're all particular expressions of our God incarnating in and through creation. Even the tiny bacteria at the very foundational layer of organic life, that those, those have a body and are therefore articulations or expressions also of incarnation. And then finally, we come to us ourselves, human beings. And our embodiment is the bit here that we have got to try and get correct. Um, whereas the conventional understanding says that incarnation is only of the past or just over 2,000 years, um, or if you're to include some of the major world religions, some people might expand it to 5,000 years. Modern science, paleontology, the study of human origins, show that we as a species have been on this planet for 7 million years. And we are the most recently evolving expression of God working through bodies in creation. So our, our God has been fully with us every step of the way, as our God is in all the other embodied expressions as well. So how do we come to terms then with that, even in terms of ourselves as humans, and this expanded horizon of what it means to be an embodied creature? But the main point I'm trying to make here, I suppose there are two key points now emerging. Incarnation, when we hear the word, we need to think of embodiment. God works in and through bodies. And then laterally, for us as embodied creatures, our God-given story is not one of just 2,000 years and a few thousand years. It's a God-given story of 7 million years. As Mark has already indicated, I explore and develop some of these ideas in two of my books, and then I give you a reference to a third one later. Now, I'm jumping here through several loops. Um, and so um, this little phrase from Luke's gospel, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, he passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. This is a text with some parallel texts that the commentators have not dealt with very well. There's a very crucial point to be made here. The spirit is expelled from a particular habitat, and then it goes around searching for an alternative habitat. And the point is, spirit can do nothing without body. And so the line I have at the bottom of the screen, body is lifeless without spirit, but spirit is impotent without body. In the Christian tradition, many of us have been up, brought up with the idea of a dualistic split between the body and the soul. And today I'd prefer to talk about that between the body and the spirit, as if they are totally irreconcilable. or can only be reconciled in and through the death and resurrection of the historical Jesus. But we need to understand things in a bigger line now, that, th that body and spirit are not actually opposed at all. They are highly complementary. 
and highly complementary in the plan of God for all creation. Therefore, the universe has spirit in it, the trees have spirit in it, the bacteria have spirit in them. So body is lifeless without spirit, but spirit is impotent without body. Now, then the two quotations that I sent you in advance, um, which are applied mainly to the Christian story, first from the late Sally McFaig, a Canadian theologian, thus Christianity's manner of making contact with the most basic physical biological processes is through an inclusive radical interpretation of its doctrine of the incarnation, not merely in one human being, Jesus of Nazareth, in other words, we must no longer reserve the concept to that one particular expression. But in the world as God's body. Our God then incarnation begins with the story of the whole creation. As a primary articulation and expression and revelation of how God works in and through the world. And particularly how the divine creativity works in and through all embodied expressions. God is always incarnate, always bound to the world as its lover. As close to it as we are to our own bodies and concerned before all else to see that the body, namely God's world, flourishes. And in Christian spirituality, this idea of flourishing, uh, the key text often is John 10.10. 10. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. But of course, we have tended to understand that as being about human beings only. We must never again hear it in that narrow uh, anthropocentric sense. We now need to hear that, that statement as applied to all embodied expressions of our God at work throughout creation. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then the second quotation, which um, Mark read at the beginning from the American theologian Elizabeth Johnson, incarnation bespeaks a different form of divine presence marked by an unimaginable intensity of intimacy. That's a very profound statement. It is presence in the flesh, asar. Now, in the longer explanation of this quote, she highlights the, this Hebrew word, basar, which means flesh. But she indicates that a more accurate translation would be fleshiness. And she contrasts it with the word used by Paul in his letters, sarx, S-A-R-X. Sarx usually means the flesh that's prone to sin. Whereas the word basar refers to the fleshiness that belongs to all embodied organisms in creation. So you have the fleshiness of the mountain, the fleshiness of the lake, the fleshiness of the plant, the fleshiness of the animal, and human fleshiness. That's what the word basar actually means. It's a much wider and deeper meaning than the word sarks. She continues, the saving God became a human being who was part of the wider human community, which in turn shares the membrane of life with other creatures, all made from cosmic material. Because the cosmic material is the first embodied articulation and expression through which our God became incarnate. Now, bringing all that down then to the human context. So if our God is fully with us throughout our entire story, as our God is fully with everything in creation, remember that little phrase from St. Paul, when God says yes, God means yes. And so there's no lack of commitment or presence of our God with us throughout the entire story of seven million years. Then. It, we need to rethink the whole meaning of incarnation from the human point of view and from the Christian point of view. Because we now have to try and see and understand Jesus as belonging. And we need to 
to see how can we resituate Jesus within this long evolving story. Now, I'm not aware of any theologian who's dealing directly with this material as yet, because it really creates huge challenges. And some of them are immensely disturbing for conventional Christians. Because basically, if our God is with us throughout the entire story of the seven million years, then we need to come to terms, it seems to me, with the fact that what Jesus is about is summarized in these three words. Jesus is about an affirmation, confirmation, and celebration of all we achieved over the seven million years. Because believe it or not, and I know it's notoriously difficult to hear this and to accept it, we actually got it right most of the time throughout that seven million years. And that's really what we should be celebrating at Christmas. We actually got it right most of the time. How come and what's the evidence? The growing body of evidence is that when we humans remain very close to nature and we honor our true place as earthlings, then we get it right. And it seems we did remain very close to nature for most of the time of the seven million years. Therefore, in that context, we need to revisit the Christian story and reinterpret it fairly radically as an affirmation, a confirmation, and a celebration. And therefore, also, of course, the huge challenge here, if we did get it right most of the time, what do we now need to do as a species to begin getting it right again? And that will probably take some major crisis to push us in the direction of trying to get it right once again. So this then is um, the, the understanding that I think we need to move to and begin to embrace. The difficulty here for conventional Christians, and indeed for the kind of indoctrination that many of us have been given, in this understanding then Jesus doesn't come to rescue us from anything because we got it right most of the time. And so we, we concepts like salvation and redemption need to be rethought. We don't need to get rid of them, but they will need to be rethought in the language which is fairly widely used by theologians today. We will need to rework the tradition. So we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater here, but there is a huge amount of reworking to be done. And it's, it's very much part of that theology that's coming from the ground up and is pioneered mainly by lay people. I think this is a wonderful moment in our faith as a Christian people, uh, disturbing in many ways, immensely challenging, but also hugely inspiring. And it's really what we should be um, dealing with and affirming in our understanding of Advent, which we're coming up to very shortly, and then our celebration of Christmas, which follows later. Now, <clears throat> because we live these days in a multicultural world and a multi-faith world, um, we also need to draw parallels here with the other great world religions. Uh, this is something which fundamentalist Christians are horrified when they hear me speak about this, because they think I'm diminishing the uniqueness Actually, they think I'm diminishing the superiority of Jesus, which maybe I am. I'm certainly not diminishing the uniqueness of Jesus. If anything, I'm reinterpreting it. So if the coming of Jesus in our time marks something of a millennial um, evolutionary epoch, in other words, why then does Jesus come around 2,000 years ago? Um, I won't address that question now because it's quite complex, uh, but it has something to do with a millennial uh, evolutionary moment. And so if that's happening for in the context of our Christian faith, then presumably it's also happening and was happening in the context of some of the other great religions as well. And so when we look at the early tradition behind Hinduism and, and the other um, uh, great Eastern religions, uh, we learn in the Vedas about a primordial person. In Hinduism, we hear of the avatars. In Buddhism, the bodhisattvas. In Islam, we have the notion of the prophets, of which Jesus and Mary are included. 
In the great African traditions, we have the diviners, known primarily to be healers. And then in prehistoric times, we have the shamans and the shamanesses. Now, in all these examples, they're human beings. They're not divine. They're human beings, but considered to be so highly evolved that they serve as models for the rest of us on our journey into fuller life. So once again, they're human beings, but considered to be so highly evolved that they serve as models or examples for the rest of us on our journey into the fullness of life. Now, again, without making the thing too complicated, but when we talk about today in the Christian story, Christology, our understanding of the theology of Jesus, this is the direction now in which things are moving. We're not denying the divinity of Jesus, but we're trying to acknowledge that the divinity of Jesus has often been used to justify imperialism, to justify patriarchy, to justify hierarchy from the top down, and to justify a form of being human that, that sets us over in being alien to every other life form. Today, the um, Christian theologians are trying to look more at the humanity of Jesus. And they're suggesting that's the bit we really need to come to terms with. And so I'm going to offer you a few little statements here. They're not on the screen. And then some of them will be familiar to you already. You will remember St. Irenaeus. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. It's in and through the fullness of our humanity that we can begin to see and experience the glory of God. A Canadian theologian called Gregory Baum has a lovely statement. God is what happens to a person on the way to becoming human. It's the humanity of Jesus, that radical new way of being human, that we Christians need to come to terms with. And I think if we can become, become more familiar with that, then we can begin to see in a more practical, organic way, the meaning of divinity. So again, that statement from Gregory Baum, the glory of God, God is what happens to a person on the way to becoming human. And, and there are quite a number of those kind of statements circling around now at the present time. Moving towards the end of my presentation then, I want to uh, acknowledge the events that's opening up today um, in Azerbaijan, the COP29, trying to address some of the serious ecological and environmental problems of our time, which we have seen uh, the horrendous consequences of the people of Spain in the past week or two. And so as we try to touch in to what, what's happening with incarnation in our world today, how do we see the spirit incarnating in our suffering earth? And what are we called to do about that? And so I suggest, whether it's in this example or in a range of other situations that you will be obviously be reflecting on, I believe we're called to a vision of greater expansiveness, of greater expansion, of being able to include what in the past we divided off as secular and sacred. And also then at the spiritual level for each one of us, there's a big challenge here for integration. That's now emerging as a key word in contemporary spirituality. So perhaps those are the two words we can take away from this reflection this morning. As a Christian people, incarnationally, theologically, we've been called into that greater sense of expansion and that new challenge into integration. Finally, this is not a sales stunt, but I have this book coming out in about two or three weeks time, um, Joy to the World, Christmas Carols, made new for the 21st century, in which you will find a lot of these thoughts and ideas um, in a very basic, simple version. Um, the book is published by a little known press called Sleepy Line Publications or Sleepy Line Publishing. And it will also be available to Amazon, but it's not flagged up there as yet. Just take a quiet moment as we end the reflection.
Okay, Mark, I hand it back to you. Dermot, thank you. Um, as someone with a theological educator, it's always great to see a romp through some um, big terms um, in, in theology, and uh, you took us on quite a journey um, and invited us to expand our own understanding of some of these traditional concepts, which I know has been in many ways um, your vocation. It's what you offer to the world to see anew, afresh, in the light of what we now know about this expanding universe. And I also think in, in, in summarizing and finishing, that I just want to welcome your positivity. I talked about the sunshine returning to us in the light of the anti-cyclonic gloom. And I think it's fair to say that many, many people throughout the world are caught up in some sort of grayness as we see events unfolding. But you have reminded us, us that we are participants in a bigger story, a story that we are co-creators in by virtue of our embodiment of that cosmic life. So thank you for that, um, that note of optimism, of positivity, of, of expansion. Um, and also, again, something that's always welcome, your delight in the universal, that truly, that truly Catholic uh, vision. So thank you again, and we look forward to having you speak to us in the future. So we finish with our closing prayer. May the divine assistance be always with us and with our absent sisters and brothers. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Well, it's just time now for me to add my thanks to Marx, to you, Dermot, for that wonderful talk this morning. I'm sure it's stretched uh, very many of us. And looking by the comments that are coming up, uh, it, everybody has enjoyed it immensely. And for those of you who would like to hear it again, could I remind you that it will it is on YouTube. Uh, we do record these talks to YouTube, and if you just go on and search for Benedict Swell, you will find that it will come up there. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe to Benedict Swell, that's even better. It doesn't cost you anything, but it does mean that we um, get the numbers up, which is always good, and then you can get all of the back ones. So anyway, that's just a little plug for that this morning, but thank you so much, Dermot. <clears throat> uh, and now it's time for us to look forward to next week and we have uh, Bob Morley with us we're not sure what the title of his talk will be but I'm pretty certain it will be on his poetry uh, and Bob has talked to us before he lives in the Eden Valley and has been a resident in Cumbria for over 45 years uh, contemplative, Bob has been meditating regularly in stillness and silence since 1988. Since this time, Bob has followed the works of well-known mystics from many religious traditions, past and present, and searching as they did to know his own core being, his relationship with the divine, and the meaning and purpose of earthly life. His active life included a career in nuclear engineering, in operations and environmental management, including for the past 35 years, voluntary befriending roles for people who are despairing, suicidal, victims of crime and a support to the bereaved and dying, and as a spiritual companion to others on life's journey. So uh, I know Bob will have a lot to offer us next week. So we look forward. In the meantime, have a very good week, but we look forward to seeing you again next week. So God's blessing on your week. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. I am unmuted. Thank you. Thank you for an awakening. It was fantastic and a lot to think about, to love at first, love one another and Benedict's well. Thank you all. Thank you, Fred.